Hey everyone, welcome to the Bruce Williams channel. I'm trying something new with my lighting. I'm just having fun with it. So bear with me there. Uh, let's do a wrist check before we jump into the main topics. I am wearing the Rolex Day Date. This is a watch that I just can't get enough of. I wear this most days and I think it's just perfect for me in every way. I, <laughs> I can't get enough of it. Now today, let's go over a couple items of news and then we'll touch on the topic of watch brands losing touch with their consumer base or maybe even losing touch with reality. So the big news of the past week, Rolex acquires the retailer Bucherer. And as I understand, the uh, the independent watch brand Carl F. Bucherer is also included in that acquisition. So the knee-jerk reaction is to go, hey, what's Rolex's motive here? Are they trying to gain more control over all points of sale instead of selling to an authorized dealer every watch at about 38% off? <laughs> Are they now going to be selling directly to the consumer and making that extra 38% on every watch sold at those roughly 50 different locations? You know, you, you kind of go to that place with your brain. And it makes sense in a buyer's market when it comes to watches that Rolex is buying retailers and they're buying watch brands. They're making big moves. One could argue that they're playing 4D chess while other brands are increasing retail prices and they're coming out with ridiculous limited editions and they're seemingly taking the value out of various products that they offer and angering the most you know, enthusiastic of their consumer base, which is us watch collectors. So tell me what you think about that. Is it all about control and what's the future when it comes to Rolex? Do they want to control all points of sale when it comes to new watches and certified pre-owned watches? I'd be interested to hear your take. Now, another piece of news on September 1st, Tudor will be increasing retail prices in the United States. And I'm hearing on average about 2%. So it's not a massive increase, certainly nothing like JLC, which, I mean, they went hog wild with upping those prices, sometimes, you know, with some models up to 40%. It really was quite shocking when they did that. Tudor, you know, about 2%. So not a huge retail price increase, but they are slowly chipping away at that value proposition that I think they are so good at. Every time I buy a Tudor watch, I look at the retail price and then I look at the finish work. I look at the tactile elements from the bezels to the crown to the T-fit clasps. I look at the detail work. I look at the loom. I look at the movements. And I always think that they offer quite a bit of satisfaction for the prices, right? For the products that they bring to the market. They make, you know, a really solid product for not an arm and a leg retail price wise. So they really are the last truly great value rich luxury brand. But the question is, do they want to be seen with that label? I don't know. Maybe they don't. Maybe uh, this is a strategy. It's more than just adjusting for cost of materials and labor and paying for that new uh, production facility and whatnot. I think that part of it is, is, is uh, you know, just focused on where they want their brand to sit in the market as Rolex moves up market. Do they want Tudor to move and fill that place that Rolex used to be? That would make logical sense. Now let's go to, uh, let's see, we're going to touch on IWC and we are going to touch on Seiko. And this is the part of the video where I may get a little bit feisty and a little bit negative, which is a little outside of my personality, but let's start with IWC. They recently announced a watch that at first glance I thought looked so dang cool and I was all about it. Full ceramic. I'm on board with that. Uh, 41 millimeters, pilot's piece, an aviation piece with a full loom dial that's meant to last for hours. And so I, I just think looking at that concept, it's a very exciting modern release. And then I noticed that little icon at the six o'clock position, the black aces. And I thought, oh, that's all I am going to be able to notice now as I look at the face of this watch. So five minutes ago, I was a potential consumer. I was seriously thinking about going out to try to buy one. And now I'm not even, I'm not even interested because I think IWC ruined this release by tying it in 
to the Black Aces. Now, I'm not a member of the Black Aces. I don't have any ties to the Black Aces. There may be some of you out there watching that go, Bruce, no, that's really cool. You know, <laughs> you're, you're dead wrong about this, but I don't think so. I think most of you would agree with me. IWC took a great concept and then they limited its appeal by tying it in with the Black Aces. And so they are going to sell fewer watches. In a buyer's market, a watch brand wants to sell fewer watches. It makes me scratch my head. And I was texting with one of my friends about this. And let me actually read his comment because it made me laugh. I relate to it. Uh, my friend Rob says, Could you imagine a simple full loom dial without the logo? I feel like sometimes companies, watch companies, purposely try to screw with us. <laughs> oh, it just made me laugh. Tell me if you can relate to that. And tell me if I'm dead wrong about this IWC release. I think it looks so cool. It's just been ruined by a tiny little thing. Am I being unrealistic or can you relate to my sentiments? Now let's go to Seiko. This one I'm going to label as a straight up value proposition turd. This is the SJE 093. Now I know a lot of you are very excited about this release and you're going finally a sub 40 millimeter 62 MAS re-edition. And this one is thin, right? Seiko has never placed emphasis on making thin dive watches, but this one is 12.5. And it really is faithful to that original reference that debuted in 1965 when it comes to the overall design details and proportions. But outside of that, right, you look at the retail price, $3,500. And you think, wow, where is the value here? There is no bracelet. There is no quick adjust clasp. There is no, um, I mean, outside of a thin profile, there is nothing technically impressive about this reworked caliber. It has average finish work. It has a 45 hour power reserve, no silicon hairspring, no free sprung balance. This has, um, you know, just a basic Dia shock protection system and an Etacron regulation system, and it's accurate to an acceptable daily deviation rate of 25 seconds per 24 hour time period or minus 15 to plus 10 seconds per day. So, I mean, you look at the movement, you look at the bezel action, you look at the lack of a bracelet. Sure. You have a 2000 piece, roughly limited edition in a collector's box from Seiko. And, and you just think, wow, Seiko, <laughs> what were they thinking when it comes to the price of this piece? I think they did it just because they can get away with it. They know people are starved for retro designs in sub 40 millimeters. And they think, hey, this is the number of watches we think we can sell. And, uh, you know, at this given price, could they sell more if they made it non-limited and, uh, you know, lowered the price. I'm sure they could. Could they make more profits by adjusting the strategy? I think they could, but maybe don't. Maybe they don't. So here's something to consider. You know, should watch brands be focused on limited editions and special editions and retro re-releases or regional market exclusive editions? Or should they be focusing in on paring down the product catalog and trying to inject some value and maybe a really positive uh, buying experience or, or whatnot? Should they be focused in on acquiring uh, brand celebrities or should they be focused in on retaining customers and uh, getting us crazy watch collectors to want to part with our hard-earned money and not just wait for that Rolex call because we know that that still has value for money. It really is a strange time to be a watch collector. It is an exciting time. It is kind of a fun time, but it's an odd time at the same time. I'm saying, I'm saying way too many times here in this video, forgive me. I don't script these, I just start rambling. So tell me what you think in the comment section and please call me out if you think I'm wrong. If you think the Black Aces is amazing, or the SJE093 is the greatest thing since sliced bread, or you like the uh, you know acquisition of Bucherer by Rolex and the retail price increases of Tudor, <laughs> tell me your take in the comment section. If you've made it this far, I really appreciate it. I try to post every other day here on my channel. I put a lot of time into creating varied watch content. So if you're able to, please like this video. Please subscribe to my channel. That really helps me out a lot. And uh, yeah, have a great day. See you in the comment section.